Amen. All right, well, we're there in Philippians chapter number 2. Let's go ahead and start in verse 1 this evening. Uh, Philippians 2, look at verse 1. Look at verse 1 there. The Bible says this. This is, of course, uh, Paul speaking under, under inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He says, If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ. Keep in mind, he's talking to a church here, okay? So he's talking about relationships within a church. Um, he says, If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, these are all good things, any bowels of mercy. So he's saying, Here are some good things you should have, and if you want those things, here's how you accomplish that. Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Then verse 3, he kind of gives us the secret here. He says, let nothing be done. Look, there's a lot of things we do in our life. There's a lot of things we do in, in church here. There's a lot of day-to-day -day activities in, in our lives. And here Paul says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. He clarifies that here in verse 4. He says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So this evening, we're going to talk about Paying attention. We're going to talk about paying attention. The title of the sermon uh, this evening comes from circumstance that happened to me some time ago, and I'm sure this has happened. This circumstance has happened countless times to men across the world throughout history. But I was uh, I was at home one evening. I was busy. I was doing something, and I was focusing. My mind was somewhere else. And somewhere in the ether, somewhere in another universe, I hear my wife's voice um, say to me, "Did you hear anything I just said?" And I think to myself, that's a really weird way to start a conversation. Okay, but the point is that that right there, the title of the sermon this evening is, Did You Hear What I Just Said? And the reason is that little exchange there, right, this, this joking, okay, ah, I, didn't, I didn't hear what you said, something my wife has, has told me before, is the embodiment of what we're going to be talking about. Okay, so this whole idea of not listening to someone and how important it is. Okay, because it goes, we're going to use, it's kind of the foundational example of the sermon. We're going to be talking a lot about having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone and not listening to that person and not paying attention, whether it's you just not listening or it's talking about yourself or just talking about what you want to talk about. This idea of focusing and paying attention to other people and how important it is, is what we're going to be talking about. And you say, okay, but... Do we really need a whole sermon on this? I mean, do we really need a whole sermon on paying attention in a conversation? I think we do, and here's why. This is something that every single one of us, myself included, in fact, the inspiration of the sermon partly came from me thinking about, man, this is something I need to work on. This is something I need to improve on. But this is something that every single one of us needs to work on. Amen. Guaranteed. If you walk out of here this evening and you don't think the sermon applied to you, it went over your head. Because this is something that we all could apply and we all can improve upon, okay? So what we're going to do this evening, and you say, okay, pay attention to who? What, do you, what specifically? I'm talking about everyone. I'm talking about paying attention in, in church to the sermon. I'm talking about paying attention to your friends when they're talking to you, um, at work, uh, to, your, to your spouse, to your family. Everyone we come across, we're going to look at the importance. And not just, so, and don't get me wrong. I am not just talking about having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone and you're not listening. That's part of it, but what we're, what we're doing is we're looking at Focusing on other people in general. Higher relationship with your friend, your spouse, not just that specifically. And we're going to look at a lot of great benefits that can come from this. And I think a lot of us forget sometimes, okay? And a lot of consequences, a lot of severe consequences of what happens if you don't pay attention, if you don't focus on other people. So what we're going to do this evening is we're going to look at why we don't pay attention. We're going to look at if we pay attention. What, what do we get if we pay attention? What do we have to gain from it? What do we lose if we don't? And then finally, we're going to finish the sermon with how to pay attention. Some practical steps of how to actually focus on other people. So first this evening is this, why we don't pay attention. Why don't we focus on other people as much as we should? We, we, we all do this. Why don't we? What causes us to um, want to talk about ourselves too much or either not listen to other people when they're talking to us um, or, you know, when our, when our spouse or our friend is trying to get our attention and we're, in, we're not really all there and our mind's somewhere else, why do we do this? So the first this reason this evening is this, here's why we don't pay attention, is because of selfishness. It's because of selfishness. Turn to Psalm 81. Psalm chapter 81. We're going to see, there's a, there's a lot of examples about this throughout the Bible. Um, we, 
we can't look at all of them, but here's one. Here in Psalm 81, this is God speaking to the children of Israel here. This is kind of a, a flashback um, to God dealing with the children of Israel. But look at verse 10. Here the Bible says, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee up the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. He's saying, pay attention. I'm going to speak. O- open your ears. Open your mouth. I'm going to speak to you. But look at verse 11. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would not of me. So they, they didn't listen to what God had to say. They didn't care. Verse 12, so I gave them up to their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsel. So notice the contrast here between what God wanted, what God had for them, but what were they more interested in? They were more interested in what they wanted. This is why God says, so finally I just gave them up to what they wanted. What did they want? They wanted their own heart's desire. They wanted their own counsels, okay? They didn't listen because they didn't want what he had to offer. They wanted what they had to offer for themselves, okay? So, to start off the sermon this evening, I have an example. Okay, I'm going to have Jacob come up here and illustrate this. And I have a tool I'm going to use to uh, illustrate this this evening. So, I kid you not, Brother George said to me before the sermon, you should use your blower as an analogy, as a joke. Okay, Jacob, come up here. Okay. So, we're not talking about not focusing on other people, not paying attention, okay? And I'm going to use something to illustrate that. Okay, Jacob, stand right here. Okay, so Jacob, I want you, pretend we're talking, I want you to tell me about your chickens. This is something you know a lot about, so tell me about your chickens and how you take care of them and kind of the technical details that, that maybe not all of us know about. Well, chickens, I usually feed them the layer pellet. I'm sorry, what? I wasn't paying attention. I feed them the layer pellet. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. I usually in the... In the Okay, so this is obviously a, a, a goofy example, and this is obvious because I'm holding a giant Milwaukee leaf blower, okay? And you say, what does this have to do with paying attention whatsoever? Here's why, okay? I'm going to have Jacob stay here for just a couple more seconds. When we don't focus on other people, okay, in all seriousness, when someone is talking to us and we look at our phone, I know we all do this, okay? We're looking at our phone or we're dozing off or we're not paying attention. What we're doing is we are saying to that person, or, or even when we're just talking about our own interests and we don't ask other people about themselves, what we're doing is we are telling that person that their time, their knowledge, their wisdom, their effort, and anything they have to say is completely worthless to us. We don't care. And you say, oh, but no one knows. People know. And look, we should all know this too. When you're talking to someone and they're not paying attention, it is more obvious than me holding a giant Milwaukee leaf blower. Because you can tell. Because the idea is Jacob's talking and I am doing something. The whole idea of this is I am doing an action. In this case, it is using this blower. I am doing an action that is making it so I can't even hear what Jacob has to say because I don't care. Okay? When you're sitting in church and pastor's preaching a sermon, but think about this. Because again, and, and again, because when, when, you're, when you're preaching, you can tell when people aren't paying attention either, right? So when you are sitting in church and you're dozing off and you're not paying attention, you are sitting in the pew, you're sitting in the chair, and you are holding up a leaf blower and you're going... <laughs> Idea being, what you are telling pastor, or what, even in a conversation, what you're telling your friend, what you're telling your wife, and I know especially with, with our, our spouses we can get more used to this, right? Because we're, we're, we're around each other more than anyone else and we're used to it. But what you're telling them is, what you have to say to me right now, I don't care. I don't care. In fact, I'm going to do an action to where you're talking, but I'm not, I can't even hear what you're saying. Did you hear what I just said? No, because we chose not to pay attention. Okay, thank you, Jacob. I set this here. So, and, you know, again, you think, okay, well, obviously, I mean, you're holding up a big leaf blower. It's, it's, it's obvious. No, when you are, when someone is not paying attention to you, it is just as obvious to you as if they were holding a big red leaf blower, Okay. So just want to get that idea across. It's about valuing other people's time. It's about valuing other people's wisdom, and, which, and we're going to talk about this later, but you should genuinely value other people's time. You should value and enjoy hearing other people's wisdom and what they know about and what they have to say, okay? So selfishness. It's selfish. We, we care more about what you're telling that person is I care more about the time or this text I just got or I care more about what else I'm thinking about. But here's the other reason we don't pay attention, and I think this is, this is a little more valid of an excuse, and so this is, I think, what we use as an excuse most of the time. 
is distractions. Distractions. The other major reason we fail to focus on other people is we're distracted. Now, I will say this, obviously, as, as people, you know, as men, it's not like we don't have legitimate things not to be distracted by. It's not that we don't have important things in our mind. It's not that we are constantly 24-7 thinking about work life and family life and church and things we have to do and things we have to do tomorrow and this and that. All these different things that are our legitimate responsibilities in life. We all have duties. We all have responsibilities in life. And these things should be on our mind. We should be thinking about them. However, when we get in a situation where we are focusing on our friend or we are focusing on someone else we are talking to, we need to be able, we need to have the capability of at least temporarily being able to take all these matters and set them to the side and give this person our undivided attention. I know it's a lot easier said than done, but this is what we have to learn to do. Turn to Philippians 2. See things from other people's perspective. Because look, how, how selfish is it? Because look, distraction, selfishness, they're both the same thing. It's just that distractions are maybe a more common excuse, okay? No one says, I'm sorry I wasn't paying attention because I'm selfish. People say, I'm sorry I was distracted, okay? So how selfish is it of us to expect someone else to give, uh, give us their undivided attention when we are speaking to them, and yet we don't give them that in return? Because look, you would, be, you would be offended if you were talking to someone. Here's, here's, here's what we do, okay? We're talking to someone, and we're offended when they pull out a leaf blower, and they, or they're not paying attention, or they're distracted, but yet we will do the same thing to other people. Okay, so a lot of this is just a failure to see things from other people's point of view. Okay. Turn to, you're there in Philippians 2. And look, here's a hard truth, okay? And look, God forbid that this, this be said of us as Christians, you know, in, in a church, but most people out there are incredibly self-centered. Most people out there only care about themselves. They don't care about anyone else. But God forbid that that be said of us. Amen. You know, you see people out in the world, and, you know, we all know what, you know what I'm talking about here, but you see people in the world, and sometimes you'll see two people having a conversation. And just look, we all know what it's like to be talking to someone and that look in their eyes that they are not at all listening to what we're saying, and they're just waiting for us to shut up so they can talk and they can talk, and what they're saying doesn't even have to do with what we just said because they're not paying attention. We all know what that's like, but have you ever seen two people maybe out in the world or you know, at work, and they're both talking to each other, they're conversing back and forth, but they, neither of them are paying attention to the other person, so like their conversations aren't even making sense together. They're just both talking about their own interest, right? God forbid that, that, that be said of us. Amen. Talk about an area where we should be different. Look at verse 19, Philippians 2. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus us shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded. Notice, notice what he says about this man, Timothy, who will naturally, that means he doesn't have to try to do this or fake it, that means it naturally comes to him, who will naturally care for your state. And then he says, verse 21, verse 21 here, he tells this truth, how most people are just selfish. Like the world, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. It was the same in Paul's day as it is today. For all seek their own, not the things which are in Jesus Christ. He's saying, you know what, most people out there, they're just seeking what they want. They don't care about Jesus or they don't care about other people. They just care about themselves. And he is saying this in contrast. He is saying this to, to point out how rare this is that Timothy is like this. Where he's going to go there and he's going to naturally care for not his own self, but their state. Okay. So through this uh, sermon, I'm going to, a few different times, I'm going to uh, quote, a, quote a, a few quotes from a book I read a while ago. I think this is a great book, personally. I think um, it would be good for everyone to read this book. But this is a book written in 1936 called How to Win Friends and Influence People. And like every piece of valid, you know, worldly advice, all it's really doing is taking a biblical concept and elaborating on it. Essentially, this book summed up is, you know, be friendly. Right? A man who has friends must show himself friendly. But there's a lot of practical um, advice in here and wisdom. And one quote from this book was written by Dale Carnegie. And one thing that he said in here is he says, quote, The world is so full of people who are grabbing and self-seeking. So the rare individual who unselfishly tries to serve others has an enormous advantage. He has little competition. Here's what he's talking about here, okay? When he says the unselfish person who is rare has no competition, everyone out there in the world, they're competing. They're competing with each other. It's a cutthroat world. Everyone's trying to one-up someone else. Everyone's trying to, everyone's envious of other people, trying to 
themselves seem more than they are. This is just the world. This is just this, do, you know, the, the phrase dog eat dog world. This is how it is out there. And it's a losing game. Playing this game and trying to, you know, selfishly compete with other people and try to, you know, even in a, in a simple conversation, try to one-up people and, oh, well, I know this and I know this and, well, I, I have this and I have this. That's a losing game because you can never keep up with the Joneses and you can never, you're never going to be the smartest person in the world and the richest person in the world and the most interesting person in the world. So what he's saying here is that someone who just instead, in contrast, has a conversation or deals with people in a way where they just are talking about the other person and they're, they're asking about the other person and they, they are there not to talk about themselves but to focus on the other person. He's saying, you know, this person, they've opted out of the, co- of the competition. And look, there is an enormous peace of mind with doing this, with forfeiting the competition. Amen. With stepping out and saying, you know what? I don't really care. I don't really care. And look, I'm, what I, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying, obviously, when you're talking to people that you never say anything about yourself. Look, especially in a church, people care about you. They want to know your interest and what you have to say. And people want to know, um, you know, what, what you did this week. People care. That's not what I'm saying. But what it's saying is that we should be, the, the majority of us should be more focused and care for the state of other people more than ourselves. And if we do that, we will have this peace of mind of, you know what? I have to compete. I don't have to. Um, it's not a competition over who can talk about themselves more. There's a, there's a great peace of mind with that. Okay. So why don't we pay attention? Well, selfishness is one. This is kind of the core of it. And then there's distractions. Like we can't let, I, I get there's a lot of things that we have going on and a lot of valid distractions we can have, but we still have to get used to. If you're going to have friends and you're going to have a church family and you're going you're gonna to want people to, to, to like you, you have to get used to being able to take all, everything that's on your mind, setting it aside for a moment, and giving that other person your undivided focus and attention. Because that's what we want from other people, right? When we have other people, you know, we'll get frustrated when someone's not paying attention to us, but we don't, we don't ask them what they have on their mind. We don't ask them why they're distracted. We just care about how other people treat us, right? So if we can care more about other people, it will get better in every direction. Okay, so what about this? So we know why, right? We're selfish, we get distracted. That's why we don't pay attention to other people and and focus on other people. But what happens if we do? What happens if, what do we gain? Turn to 1 Kings 12. What happens if we can manage to pay better attention? And at the same time, um, at the same time, what do we lose if we don't? If we don't pay attention, do we lose any from that? Does that cause any harm? The first thing that we will gain or lose if we don't pay attention is wisdom. Paying attention and focusing on other people, you're going to find there's a lot of, even I I think about this very often in this church, there's a lot of smart people out there who know a lot of stuff. And if we can pay attention more to other people and and focus on just just getting to know other people, we're going to gain a lot of wisdom. The same goes with, you know, with, with, with listening to pastor when he's preaching. That's a great example. If you just listen, you're going to gain a lot of wisdom that you will lose if you don't. You're there in 1 Kings 12. We won't read this whole story. A lot of us are familiar with it. But here we have the story where you have Solomon's son, Rehoboam. He's king now, and he's about to make a, a major decision. And long story short, all the people go up to him, and they say, Hey, you know, your father was a great king, but, you know, we, we had a pretty high tax rate. We want lower taxes. We, want, we don't want to um, make our burden lighter, make things a little easier for us. You know, the temple's built now, and all the major construction um, uh, projects are done. Make it a little easier for us, okay? And notice in verse 4, this is what they're asking, Thy father, this is Solomon they're speaking about, made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke which he put on us lighter, and we will serve thee. Verse 5, And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me. And the people departed. So he says, Ah, let me think about it. Let me, let me consider some things. Come back in three days and I'll let you know my decision. So, verse 6 says, And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father. Well, he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou be a servant unto this people this day, and will serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, notice, and we're going to look at this later, but notice in their wisdom, they're saying, Hey, think about it from their point of view. 
Consider their perspective, and they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men which he had given them, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, and which stood before him. So, of course, he rejects his counsel, and he listens to his buddies that he grew up with. And what, what essentially what these old men were trying to get across to him was the idea of servant leadership. The idea of, hey, if you listen to them and they know that you have their best interests in mind, they will be loyal to you. He rejected that wisdom, uh, that, that, that wisdom and that knowledge, and everything fell to pieces. But why? What did he lose by not listening? Wisdom. And because of that, because he didn't act with that wisdom, it's, it cost him dearly. It cost him half of his kingdom just because he wouldn't listen. More about what he wanted than what the people wanted, okay? Just by caring about his own interests. You don't have to turn there, but Proverbs 1.5 says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning. What happens if you hear? You will increase learning. Amen. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Okay? So how do I increase learning? How do I learn more? By listening. By listening. It's very, it's very simple. Especially in a church like this, you know, where we're surrounded by, by uh, wise people and a wise pastor. If you listen, we will learn. We will get wisdom. You know, something I thought about when I was, when I was writing this is um, something that this reminded me of is, is something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Okay, now what you say, what is the Dunning-Kruger effect? Um, I'll, I'll read you an article, a brief paragraph that describes it, and then I'll, I'll kind of talk about it. Um, this is from an article called, What is the Dunning-Kruger effect? The Dunning-Kruger effect occurs when a person's lack of knowledge and skill in a area causes them to overestimate their own competence. By contrast, this effect also drives those who excel in a certain area to think the task is simple for everyone, leading, leading them to underestimate their abilities. So here's what this is, is saying. This is basically a cognitive bias, is what this is talking about, that people have, where it's a tendency that the less someone knows about a certain topic, the more they will think they know about it, and therefore the more overconfident they will be. Okay? So you say, what does this have to do with this? Well, here's the problem. If you never listen, you never learn what people have to say. If you never listen, you're never going to learn. But here's the thing. You'll think you know everything. If you don't get wisdom and you don't um, take information in, it's, it's humbling. When you learn a lot about a certain subject, it can be very humbling because you think to yourself, man, this is a really vast field or a really vast pool of knowledge. I have a lot left to learn. So it's saying if you never listen, you'll never learn, and you'll think you know everything. But here's the problem with that. Everyone else around you who is listening and is learning, they're going to be able to look, not just the expert on the situation, but everyone else who is listening and learning, they'll look at you and everyone else will be able to see through your overconfidence. Okay? Everyone can see. Now, an example of this I thought of is, let's say I went to Brother Trevor, okay? And let's say I spent last night, I watched some YouTube videos. Um, Brother Edwin today called this a YouTube scholar. I thought that was an interesting term. So I watched, a, let's say I spent all evening watching hours worth of YouTube videos on how, how a dairy works. Look, I would probably learn some things. I, I would. I, I would. I would get information. I'd learn some things. Now let's say I went to Trevor after that, and I'm like, you know what? It's pretty simple, this whole thing. I get the basics. I, I get how, you know, the milk goes from point A to point B. And let's say I just start talking to Trevor about how to run a dairy. And say, you know, here's the thing, Brother Trevor, you know, when you have the milk pumper machine and you hook it up to the cow, you got to be careful because you'll get buildup of calcium chloride, hydraulic sulfate, acidic, uh, that will build up in the tubes. And, and you got to take a mixture of uh, a compound of, of hydrochloroclide um, acetone and watch. And I just started just talking to him about what I thought I knew. I made all that up, but you get the idea. You know, Trevor would look at me, and he would never say this, because Trevor's a great guy, but you know what he would think? This guy's an idiot. <laughs> this guy's a fool. But this is how it is, where if we don't listen, we're going to fall into this trap. If we don't listen to other people, right? If, you know, you, you know because here's the thing. You want to learn about how to run a dairy? You should talk to Brother Trevor. You should ask him about how to run a dairy. You should get knowledge from him. If you want to know about a certain topic, and you know someone who's an expert in that area, you should talk to that person. If you want to know about automotive parts, you should talk to Brother George. If you want to t uh, learn about electrical engineering, you should talk to Pastor, or the Bible, you should talk to Pastor. But the idea being, you get information not by talking about what you think you know, but about listening to people who do know about that stuff. 
And the danger we can fall into is if we don't do that and all we want to do is talk and talk and talk and throw our, um, you know, showcase our knowledge that we think we have, that's just going to make us look like fools to, to other people who actually do. And everyone can, can see straight through it. So it's just something to watch out for. So, if we, so we're talking about if we pay attention, right? We already know why we don't pay attention. It's because of selfishness and, and distractions. But what do we gain or what do we lose if we don't? Well, wisdom's one of them. You will gain wisdom if you listen to other people, but you'll lose it just as fast if you don't. But here's the other thing you have to gain. I think this is just as important. You'll get perspective. You'll get perspective. Turn to Titus 3. We're not going to reread it, but think of Rehoboam. Again, like I, I mentioned a little bit, what was it that he lost? What, what, what was the failure? Why did he make the wrong judgment call? It is because he failed to see things from their perspective. All he saw, thing, he was sitting in his castle, and he's sitting in this kingdom that, that his daddy built for him, in this palace that his dad built for him, and he failed to step down to, to a people that he had never lived like before and actually talk to them. You, you know, the, the wise man gave him the, the correct advice of seeing things from their perspective, but you know what else he could have done is he actually could have talked to the people. He could have talked to them, hey, tell me a little bit about how this affects you. Tell me about why you want this. Let me see things from your point of view. That would have also helped him make the correct judgment call. Being capable of this will greatly improve our discernment and judgment in life. If you're there in Titus 3, look at verse 2. The Bible says to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto men. Look at verse 3. It says, For we ourselves were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and, and, and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So here's the thing that, you know, liberal Christians will twist this, this to say, oh, so therefore, because of this, you should never judge anyone for anything. You should never criticize. You should, you should never um, say something's bad or criticize any, something anyone does. That's not what this is saying. But what this verse is saying is, hey, before you make a judgment call on someone, maybe you should remember that maybe you were in that spot before. Maybe that used to be you years earlier. And maybe that'll give you a little more mercy and understanding in that situation, right? Amen. But here's the thing. If you never take time to listen to others, know them, you're never going to learn their perspective on anything. And the only perspective you're going to know in life is your own. And if that's you, you will err in judgment, I'm telling you. If, you, if the only perspective you have is this, this wide and broad world, if you only have this narrow little perspective of what you have personally experienced and done in life, you're going to miss out on a lot of proper judgment. Jesus said to, to judge, but judge righteous judgments. And there's, there's things we can do to make sure our judgment is righteous. You know, something I thought of about this was, um, I'll just read you a couple verses here, but when Jesus feeds the 5,000, if you remember, the disciples were frustrated with the people, and, you know, they just come back from this mission trip, essentially, and they told Jesus, they said, send the people away that they may buy, they may, they may buy bread. All these people come to them, and they're thinking, "All oh, these freeloaders, they, they, what, they, what are we going to do? Why, why, are they why do they keep following us? They're still here no matter where we go. We cross the ocean. They're still there every single time. Why won't they leave us alone? And now they want food? Now they want food? Now they want, what, what are we going to, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that everyone may take a little. This was their point of view. And notice Jesus reproves them here, but Notice what he, how he describes it in Matthew 15, 32. This is their attitude towards these people. Jesus says, Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude. So why, why, Jesus? Why do you have compassion? And what he's describing is he's about to describe not the disciples, not his own, but their perspective. I have compassion on the multitude because they, notice they, not I, not you, they have they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. Jesus is saying, you know, why don't you see it from their perspective? They're following me and they don't, they don't have food. They're, they can't get food. There's nowhere for them to go. They don't. All he's saying is, hey, I have compassion. The reason I do and you don't is because I am seeing things. Even Jesus Christ, 
the perfect Son of God was able to say, hey, but have you considered it from their point of view? Another example of this, we, we often see this tied to when Jesus, it mentions Jesus had compassion. In another situation, Jesus is looking at a different multitude, and in Matthew 9, 36, he, he gives a little deeper context into just the physical food that they didn't have and so on. It says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Think about that word moved. Think about, like, I think when I see the, read this, moved with compassion, I think about, you know, if you've ever had something kind of like hit you out of nowhere, something that just like made, made your heart drop out of nowhere, that just kind of hit you, that, that, that moved you greatly, uh, moved your heart greatly. He was moved with compassion. Why? Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Jesus had compassion on other people, and part of the judgment he took when assessing situations was they don't know any better. They're just stumbling and falling me because I'm, uh, they, they see some good in me and they, they, don't, they don't know. They don't know any better. They, they, they don't have a shepherd. They don't know what's true. They don't know where to go. They're lost. And Jesus, even Jesus Christ took that into consideration, whether to be upset or have compassion on people. Another quote in this book is this, quote, Any fool can criticize, complain, and condemn, and most fools do. But it takes character and self-control to be understanding and forgiving. It's another level, if you can get yourself to the point where if you listen to other people, and you, you instead of just talking over other people, and you listen, and you focus on more other people more than you focus on yourself, what you're going to find is you're going to learn a lot of their perspective that's going to help you greatly in life and in making decisions and judgment, and even assessing that person in, in individually. And even here, we see the, the perspective it gave Jesus and that he, it was, he had compassion. The disciples who did not think about their perspective were hard-hearted. And they, they, but Jesus said, you know what? They don't know any better. You know, I don't have this in my notes, but one thing I thought of um, when, I, when I was writing this is the ultimate example of this is Jesus on the cross where he's being crucified, he's being tortured and beaten, and he's literally dying there by people whose sins he is currently paying for. And he says to, to God, he prays, Lord, he said, forgive them. Forgive them? What, what are you talking about, Jesus? Forgive them? They're, they're killing the Son of God. They, they, shouldn't they be cursed? He says, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He says, they don't know any better. They don't know what they're doing. God have mercy on them. It is interesting because this is a mentality that you see in mature Christians all throughout the Bible. Think about Stephen. What did Stephen say when he was dying, when he was being killed? He said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Paul, towards the end of his life in 2 Timothy, would say the same thing. He talked about all the people who did him wrong, all the people who hurt him and did evil to him. Uh, people that Paul knew God would judge. Stephen knew those people were going to go to hell. Stephen knew that those people were going to be judged for what they did dearly if they did not get saved in their life. Paul knew this. Jesus knew this. Stephen knew this. But Paul said the same thing. He said, I pray God that it be not laid to their charge. He said, God, I'm not pressing charges. God, you do what you want, but they don't know any better. But what that takes is that takes, first of all, it takes a lot of humility. It takes a lot of humility to see things from someone else's perspective. And you know, it's still wrong what they did. They don't know any better. That's something we can all improve on, upon because we all fail to see things from other people's point of view. It's part of that selfishness that's a part of us. You know what? Some of the greatest Christians in history, even in their dying moment, you know, where, where you'd think they'd be the most angry and they'd be, they'd be the most wrathful and they'd say, I can't believe this is happening. You're all going to burn in hell. You're all going to suffer and be tortured in hell. They said, God, I'm not pressing charges. You deal with this how you want, God, but they don't know any better. Lay not this. Give them a pass, God. If they knew, they would not be doing what they're doing. It takes a lot of maturity, and that takes a lot of humility to do. Amen. So let's try to get to that point. Turn to John 13. John 13, 1. So why don't we pay attention? Right? Title of the sermon, did you listen to anything I just said? Did you hear anything I just said? That whole idea, right? The whole idea of, you know, realizing that we weren't paying attention... Why do we do that? Because we're selfish in those cases, and we're distracted. We, we're putting other things, which may be valid things, but we are not giving other people our undivided attention. 
distractions. What do we get if we pay attention? Well, we're going to get wisdom. We're going to get wisdom if we focus on other people and, and care more about what other people have to say. And we're going to get both things, by the way, which will, which will greatly improve our, our, our righteous judgment in life in general, okay? How about this? How about how to pay better? Okay, so as a last point, let's talk about some practical tips. Okay, I get it. Okay, that's why we do it. I want, I want what we have, what we can gain from it. So how do I do it? How do I pay better attention to other people? Well, I'm going to read you one more quote from this book that says this, quote, You can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. That's very true. If you can focus, you, oh, I want people to think I'm cool. I want people to, to be interested in me. I want to be, everyone wants that to one extent or another. So you say, okay, I want that. Well, be a good friend then and become interested in others. People, people and it, get, it, it will just get the worse the more you do this. But if you just go through life just trying to force other people interested in you, and hey, look how interesting I am. Look what, look what I did. And look what, what you're doing is you are just announcing to people that, hey, I, I don't care about you, I'm just trying to, I, people can tell. But by caring more about other people, that's what will make people like you and care about you in return. You're there in John 13, Matthew 12, 34, I'll just read for you, says this, O generation of vipers, this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So here's, here's the thing. What you talk about, what you say, what you don't say, that defines what is in your heart. And if all you ever do is talk about yourself and, and what uh, your own interest and your own cares, and you don't listen to what other people have to say, and you just focus on yourself, that reveals what is in your heart. You never ask people uh, about themselves. Even the th like I said, even the things you don't say. If you never are interested in other people, you never ask questions to other people about their life or their perspective or their knowledge or their wisdom, then that will reveal what's in your heart. So here's the first way to pay better attention, knowing this, is to have genuine interest in other people. Genuine interest in other people. This can't be faked, okay? Please understand, this cannot, I'm, this is not, oh, I'm just going to uh, really act like I care about other people and I'm really going to, um, or, you know, I'll just never say anything about, it, it's, it's not, it, it's, it has to come from the heart, okay? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, okay? Good and bad, okay? You have to have a genuine interest in other people. Notice this quote, it didn't say you can make more friends in two months by acting interested in other people. It said by becoming interested in other people. Okay, it's something that you must, you must generate from, from, from your own heart. You can't fake that. Okay? People can tell. People can tell when you're faking it. People can, you know, can tell when you're not really interested in what they have to say and you're just waiting for them to, to stop talking. It has to be a genuine interest in other people, which again, that takes humility. That takes selflessness. But here's the, here's the last thing, and here's really what I want to focus on and leave you with this evening. How to, be, how to pay better attention to other people. If you're in John 13... What, what I want to call this is the, the transfer of attention. Okay, the transfer of attention. Look at verse 13. Now before, look at verse 1. Chap, sorry, John 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew his hour was come. So as we're reading this, I want you to think about what Jesus had on his mind. Jesus knew what was going to come. In just, uh, in just a short amount of time, we would find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane um, pleading to God and praying to God, asking that this cup would pass from him. It mentions he was, he was so stressed and he was so sorrowful that his, his sweat were, as it were, great drops of blood. He was, uh, the idea here being, you know, if you have a, a gaping wound, it says, as it were, great drops of blood. His, his sweat, he was sweating so much, it was as if there was a gaping wound that blood was dripping from. He was so, think of all this that he knew, and we see that he was upset about, and he was, he was concerned about. He was sorrowful even unto death, he said. So this is what he has on his mind right now. When Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So think about it. He knows one guy is going to betray him, and he knows the rest are going to abandon him, knowing what he has to face alone. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, 
and that he was come from God and went to God. What does he do? He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And after that he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Skip to verse 12. Peter just throws a temper tantrum. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garments and set them down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done unto you. So he's going to teach them a lesson here, okay? Here's why, in his darkest hour, why he did this act of uh, humble service towards his disciples. Verse 13, he says, He called me Master and Lord. And he say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example. We're going to finish the sermon with this idea. Just like anything else, our greatest example in life for every single area is Jesus Christ. Amen. I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye that do them. He was teaching them a lesson here by demonstrating in the greatest possible way even, you want to talk about having a good excuse for distraction. You want to talk about having things on your mind. Here Jesus, in this hour, where he is this, he is sorrowful unto death. And he knows what he's going to face. He goes to the disciples and he, he does this act of service for them to say, Hey, I'm doing this. I am, I am the Lord Jesus Christ. I am, I am God in the flesh. I am, I am the Alpha and Omega. I, I, am, I am the one with eyes as a flame of fire, with a sword out of my mouth. And here I am, kneeling on the floor, washing your feet. If I can do that to you, sinners, who I also have to pay for your sins, you can do that to each other, to your peers. He was able to. He said, how, how do I pay attention? How do I focus on other people? You have to master this, where you were able to completely transfer the attention off yourself and place it on other people. John 15, 12, flip over just a couple chapters. And we see Jesus was the greatest example of this. John 15, 12, uh, the Bible says, Jesus says this, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. And here he, he gets detailed. Here's, here's how I have loved you. Here's, here's how I loved you and, and what I did for you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You say, okay, that's, that's obviously a great act of service, but how, why is that the greatest act? Why is that the greatest thing you can do for someone? Because think about this, okay? Stop for a moment and think about your life. Think about all the responsibilities you have. I mean, the, the responsibilities to your, to your wife, to your children. Think about all the, all the roles you have in life and the responsibilities you have in life. Think about everything you've accomplished in life. Think about everything you have planned for the future. Think about your plans for your family, for your ambitions, your hopes. He's talking about one man laying down his life for another person. And the reason this is the greatest example of this is because you can't focus on other people more than that. Because what you're doing is you're taking all these hopes and dreams and ambitions and responsibilities you have to all these different people and you are permanently throwing that away for somebody else. And that's what Jesus did for us. This is the ultimate example of focusing on other people more than ourselves. It's about, this is the ultimate example of transferring all the attention off me and all the attention off myself and everything and putting it all into somebody else. Turn it back to Philippians 2. Romans 15, I'll just read for you. Romans 15, 1 through 3 says this. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Not to please yourself. He's, he literally says, not to please yourself, but to please other people more than yourself. And again, who is the greatest example of this? Verse 3, for even Christ pleased not himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Christ was the greatest example of focusing on other people more than himself. And like I said, I know where the main thing I'm kind of um, using here is just a conversation with someone else, right, and focusing. But this goes so much deeper than that. 
This goes to your entire relationship with your friends and your brothers and sisters in Christ and your spouse. This is a philosophy of, of, of how to deal with relationships as a whole. Not just This is so much more than just a conversation we're talking about. There in Philippians 2, we'll finish here. So now we have a little more context to verses 1 through 4, right? Hey, focus on other people more than yourself. More than you. More than uh, however much you focus on yourself, you should focus more on other people. Again, who is the greatest example of this? Who did this the best? Verse 5, look at this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Sometimes I, I, I read this almost, it almost sounds like it's a parallel of this story we read um, in, in John, where he is washing the disciples' feet. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself. Think about Jesus washing the disciples' feet, the, the, the king of kings. But he made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, because of this, God hath also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, this whole idea we're talking about, this was the very embodiment of who Jesus Christ was. This is what he did for us. He, it was the ultimate transfer of attention. Of focusing, taking all the focus on, on myself and everything I have to go through and everything I have to deal with and putting that entirely in other people more than in myself. This is who Christ was. This is what he came here to do. And all he asks is us to have that same heart for each other. We can't die for each other's sins. You know, we say this to somebody, hey, I can't die for your sins because I, I have my own sins to pay for. But... Look, we have a lot of ways, down from a simple conversation all the way up to giving our life for a brother or sister in Christ. There's a lot, a lot of ways that we can exercise this and something we can all get better at, guaranteed. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.